Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to take a quick look at two helper features in the Fast LED Library that can be essential tools for easily creating impressive LED effects, periodic timers, and beat generators. Before we go on to write any new effects, we need to take a look at these two facilities. The first is a macro that allows you to run a section of code no more often than whatever millisecond interval you pick. You can mark a block of code inside your main loop to say it should run every 50 milliseconds, for example. Simply place that block in your main loop or anywhere that executes at least that often, and the rest is completely automatic. From there, we will turn our attention to beat generators. These are simple function generators that turn an increasing counter, like the millis timer, into a useful and predictable pattern. The simplest is a square wave, which just cycles off and on, and then a sawtooth wave that increases in value, all the way up to complex sine waves. Imagine that you have a monotonic increasing value, like the millis function, which returns the number of milliseconds elapsed since startup. If you then took the sine or cosine of that millisecond count, you'd get a nice sine wave that swung back and forth from negative one to positive one. Fast LED contains a set of macros that do all the calculations for you and simplify things, such that you can just specify the repeat interval in beats per minute. The range, instead of being negative one to positive one, can be any arbitrary range that you specify. Join me now as we take a quick look at intervals and beat timers, two essential topics for achieving LED greatness. Let's get started. There, that's our first point of order. Now, the first substantive change I'm going to make here is I'm going to define a variable which is going to hold our power limit in milliwatts. Then I'm going to set that power limit in the setup and I'm going to turn on a feature in fast LED that will automatically turn on an LED for you if you hit your power limit. You just give it the pin number of the LED, we'll give it the pin number of the built-in LED on the Heltec module, and it will turn that on anytime it hits the power limit and has to throttle brightness in order to stay within the power. So you get that little visual indication without having to actually print that information out on the screen and do the comparison. You'll know immediately, oop, it's throttling power. Okay, just to take some of the mystery out of it, LED built-in is something that's normally defined by whoever defines the header files for your module, but it's sort of a custom in the Arduino header files that your platform should define it. So the Heltec module indeed does define one LED built-in as whatever pin it is. It's pin 31. That pin may or may not be exposed along the side of your chip. It could be a pin that isn't exposed and is dedicated to the LED, although you'd hope not. Usually they're overloaded and you can use them for that as well as something else. Note that I already had the pin mode for LED built-in set to output. I'm not 100% certain that you're required to do this. It's possible that the fast LED library does it for you, but it doesn't appear to be documented that way. So I would always call the pin mode to set it to output for this pin before relying on it to be used as output for fast LED. With those out of the way, I can head up and define a couple of macros that I want to use. Now, array size you've seen in a previous episode, it counts the number of elements in a statically defined array. I don't mean the number of elements that are stored in it and all terminated. I mean the actual size of the buffer can be measured if it's declared in C by defining the size of the overall buffer in memory by the size of the very first element. That will tell you how many elements there are. Now, of course, the compiler knows this information. It just doesn't expose a handy way for you to get it other than through these size functions. Times per second is basically the reciprocal, times a thousand milliseconds per second, of a magical function called every n milliseconds. What every n milliseconds does is just prevents code from within the block that follows it from running if it's already run in the period defined by the number of milliseconds you specify. So if you say every 100 milliseconds, it doesn't matter how often you run through that code. If it's more often than 100 milliseconds, let's say it only takes you 50 milliseconds to get back there, when you hit that, it won't run the code. It won't come back to it, it won't delay run it, it won't do anything fancy other than look. Just basically this macro should be called no more than every n milliseconds. That's really what it's doing. No more than every n milliseconds. Now it could be less because you could forget to call it. This has to be called repeatedly if you want it to function. So you place this in your main loop and basically it's going to keep track of a timer, check that timer, see how much has elapsed. If that amount of time has elapsed, it will run your code. If not, it won't. So it's just handy semantics for keeping track of a timer. In fact, if we go look at the code, 
every n millis, which is going to be an instance of one of these types, which is going to be a C every n. And that's going to instantiate an every n time. <laughs> this is getting pretty complicated. Let's see, it's going to take one of these and make it with uint, which is right here. So yeah, I'm very close. It keeps track of when the last trigger was or when the last time the uh, timer was triggered. With, that, with those two pieces of information, it knows, should I fire again? And by fire, I just mean run. It's not going to go and wake you up or do anything like that. I know I'm kind of beating that issue up, but when I was first started, if things seemed like they could be overcomplicated, I got scared of them, right? And so I don't want you to think there's no unmaskable interrupts or anything really cool going on here. It's literally probably, are you ready? Is whether the elapsed time is greater than the period. And if it is ready, then we reset the period and either way we return whether it was or not. All we have to worry about is knowing how to use it. So where do we use it? Conveniently, we have a little block of code that we run every 250 milliseconds to update the OLED display. We're doing it by keeping track of a timer when the last timer was fired. We know it's 250 millisecond period. We're doing basically everything that the macro set does. So now for consistency, we can just use the macro everywhere. So I'm going to refactor this code to get rid of all the private variables that keep track of things and just use the macro. So if you're content to trust the code behind the macro, which having looked at it, I think I am, looks pretty straightforward, you know this will only run at most every 250 milliseconds, no matter how often you come through this loop. You have to come through at least that often if you want it to happen. I'm going to take the old bouncing ball effect from last episode out of here. I'm going to take the LED code out of here because we're now using the built-in LED for the power throttle indicator, and we're not going to be switching it off and on every frame as we used to be. We used to just kind of keep it as a heartbeat of whether things were happening, but we have the OLED screen for some status updates, and we don't really need this. I don't need to keep track of any timers, actually, including the ones for calculating frames per second, because fast LED calculates the number of frames per second for us. We can just ask it. Note that it's going to return an unsigned integer and not a floating point variable, so I had to update the print statement accordingly. So while we have the LED and it'll be interesting to know when it does power throttle, it'd be even more interesting to know by how much. You can actually ask Fast LED, what are you going to reduce the brightness to if I ask you to draw my current set of LEDs at this particular wattage limit? It will run through, do the calculation, do the division, and come back and say, oh, you should be at 128, 256, or 50% of maximum brightness. Let's add that so we have kind of some feedback and status on how much power throttling is going on. So to get the throttle brightness, you have to tell it what your desired brightness is and your desired milliwatts is. It will from there figure out what the available brightness is. Right now, this code would run in an incredibly tight loop because it's just going to show the display every 250 milliseconds and loop tightly otherwise. We need some kind of delay in here, but we want to keep it granular enough that maybe we come through this loop 100 times a second. So I'm going to delay by 10 milliseconds every pass through and then any additional delays can be added by the effect and by our effect manager if we ever add one at a later stage. First thing I'm going to add is fast LED delay for the 10 milliseconds. Now what is fast LED delay and how does it differ from delay? Let's have a look. By default, fast LED accurate clock is not defined and that means it's going to delay by one millisecond. I guess that ostensibly does kind of waste some time, but it won't affect you because it's going to still run the task scheduler and all that if there are multiple threads going on. It's going to at least to show the LEDs and yield, which means it's going to display and push all the LED data out, and that's going to yield the processor to whoever was waiting for it. Reading the code, it looks like we are guaranteed at least one call to show because it's a do, not a while loop. If we look at it, we can see it's going to come in, record the time, it's going to do delay, it's going to show at least once, that's going to yield, and then, depending on this conditional, other stuff can happen. But we fall through to a show every single time. A quick inspection of the fast LED code seems to indicate that if you don't pass a brightness value when you call show, 
which delay doesn't because it doesn't know what you wanted for a brightness value, it's going to use the scale value that it stores away. There may be other ways that that is set, but I don't know of any, so we're gonna call set brightness. Then we're just gonna call delay once because we know that it does call show every time. All right, with that out of the way, now we need to actually draw something in our main loop. So let's move on to our next topic. The next fast LED topic that I want to cover are the beat generators. They can be found in a header file called libation.8. And libation is an 8-bit lib for math functions. It has a whole ton of things that work in the Q8.8 numeric namespace, which is a fixed point where you have 8 bits of integer information and then 8 bits of past the decimal point information, basically. And so you can do fractions and that kind of thing. I'm not that interested in that because the chip I'm going to always use will have some kind of floating point support by this day and age, you would hope. If you're doing like real Atmel stuff, then definitely look at the uh, libation.8 code. It's got tons of stuff in there to keep your code really effective and efficient if you have to do things like sine and cos and other functions. If you've got a weak chip, you don't want to be calling the C runtime versions of sine and cos. Let's just say that. They will not be kind to you if you can even call them at all, depending on what your compiler supports for your chip. But we live now in the ESP32 land, which has floating point support. So what good are the beat generators and what do they do? Basically, they are functions that will, over time, return you a value that sweeps between a high and a low range in a sine wave or a cosine pattern, going back and forth between that low and high range. And how often? Well, you tell it. I want it to do this 32 times a minute or 50 times a minute, or three times a minute, or whatever frequency you want, and it will sweep the value back and forth in that range. That's all it does. If we want to drift a pixel back and forth across the screen and not just have it trivially bounce like a pong ball, we could ease it. There are easing functions in the libation.8 header file as well. There's quadratic and bicubic, I don't know. I tend to make up my own easing functions depending on what feels good, which is weird, but that's enough preamble. Let's jump right into libation.h, and we're going to skip about 800 lines of cool math just to get down to the part that we actually care about. Well, they really did think of everything. So first, I'm going to skip any of the functions that have 88 in them because they are the Q8.8 functions that I'm not going to deal with. We're going to do just regular old 8-bit and 16-bit integer. Probably the simplest of the beat functions, and you'll probably no doubt find use for this, is a value that just sweeps from zero to the high range and then resets to zero, goes up to the high range, and it does it in a sawtooth pattern. So it could be as simple as adding one each time, and depending on what your uh, frequency is. So imagine you wanted to sweep a pixel across the screen and you wanted to do it exactly 60 times a second. So there are 16-bit and 8-bit versions of this function. If we keep on scrolling down, We'll find beat sine 16 and beat sine 8, which are 16-bit and 8-bit precision versions of a sine wave. So let's say that you wanted something to sweep back and forth. Actually, you know what? The first thing I do when I find an old classic computer, as long as it has floating point support in the basic interpreter, is I crank out a little program that's going to draw a sine wave. It's like three lines of basic code that I should be able to type up in Final Cut from memory. So what that does is sweeps this sine wave back and forth, and here's what it looks like. So to do the same thing with the beat generator, we would say, in that case, to go from 0 to 40, because that's how wide the screen is. It looks like it's doing it about every two seconds, so let's say about 30 times a minute. So that's all you have to feed this function, and then just print wherever it comes back and tells you. Let's do that. That's at least interesting enough. This is the standard fade code that we've done a number of times in previous lessons. So as we draw things on the screen, things are going to fade out slowly over the course of a number of frames and not just immediately wink off. That should do it. Let's see what this does. Well, you can see there's one little problem that it leaves gaps behind. That's because the sine wave is sweeping faster than we're drawing frames, and so some frames are skipped. Now we could fix that just by drawing a wider comet like we did last time. We drew two pixels or maybe three pixels. 
but I'm going to make it variable because I can see where this is going. You can see I've reserved 10 pixels. Well, we're going to try to draw in a 10 pixel wide comment, sweeping back and forth. I got kind of a feeling it's what it's going to look like. Uh, yeah, it's a little too clever. Let's let's run it and then I'll uh, clean it up a bit. Let's see if I got that right. <laughs> Hi, for one. Welcome our new Cylon overlords. Is it Cylon? Yeah, I think that's what they were called. Cyclon? Cylons? It's also very similar to... Yeah, you know it. <laughs> Let me go back to the code and make it a little more readable. I'm still not happy about taking the address of the array element to start the fill with fill solid. I'm going to instead just use a for loop to actually poke the color into the array like we normally used to. The fill solid is clever, but eh. What the heck? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So there is an operator that will allow you to assign an integer to a color. And as you can imagine, it does not do what I wanted it to do. What I wanted it to do was stick red in there. Okay. We've got our nice big red Cylon Knight Rider effect working. So, what else can we do? Well, we can use a beat generator to pick the color. Let's try that. We'll say byte hue equals, we'll just use the 8-bit one. And if you look at, in this case, all you really need to specify are the beats per minute. And if you just do that, it will swing between 0, 0, 0 and 377 octal, which is 255. I'm not sure why it's beats me, man. Why octal, why not? And I'm gonna go a little faster, but not that fast. Because the defaults are going to run from zero to 255, and those are fully valid for hue, I'm just gonna use those values. If you've not seen CHSV before, we can actually create a color based on hue, saturation, and value, or vibrance, depending on who you ask, and it will trivially convert itself to CRGB. You can't go the other way as easily. There is a, a RGB to HSV function that you can, HSV rainbow, I believe, something like that, and that's available to do conversion, but it has to do some color table lookup, so it's not a trivial conversion. But going from hue to CRGB is, so, or close enough. It's going to go through the palette of 256, 96 times a minute. Let's just do 60. See how 60 looks. Once per second. And there we go. The Rainbow Comet. All right. The macros are fairly efficient, so I hope you can make good use of them. I hope you found it interesting, and ideally, you'll be able to make good use of the interval timers and the beat generators now that you've seen some very simple use cases. As always, I'm not selling anything and I don't have any Patreons. I'm really just in this for the subs and likes. So don't leave me hanging. Please be sure to leave me one of each before you go. Join me next time for the precision drawing that we'll need to move on to our next effect. A little pyromania as we take on a realistic flame effect. From there, it's on to simple particle systems for moving stars and fireworks. So if you're not already subscribed, be sure to do so, as this channel is so small you'd otherwise certainly miss it. In fact, you'll likely need to turn on the bell and the personal notifications as well. That way, you'll actually get notified about new effect episodes. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time out here in Dave's Garage.